Good morning. So we are living in really exciting times. The robots, they're coming. Advanced artificial intelligent agents are coming. Now I know what you think. Futurists have been telling you this stuff for 70 years. Where's Rosie from the Jetsons? Where's my sky car? Where's my jetpack? We're way past 2001, A Space Odyssey, past Blade Runner. So what is it that is about to happen that's gonna change everything? What's about to happen is that we are entering into a fourth industrial revolution. And like the prior three industrial revolutions, this is going to change fundamentally how we live our lives. So if we look back at the first industrial revolution, I'm gonna ask that my slides be moved back to the first industrial revolution. We can see that we had a major change in quality of life. We had mechanization, we had water power, steam power, the locomotive. By the second industrial revolution, we had manufacturing. We had, electric we had uh, electricity. We had the automobile. By the third industrial revolution, we had our computer infrastructure, our IT infrastructure being developed. Early robotics in structured environments. But this fourth industrial revolution is something different. This fourth industrial revolution is where we give robots and artificial intelligent agents the ability to perceive and make decisions about the world in unstructured environments. And this is gonna cause a sea change that we are right on the cusp of. It's going to cause a change that is profound in the number of people that it impacts. So robots that are currently in laboratories, like my lab at Brown, are gonna make their way into broader society. I wanna give you some historical context of what that might look like. So if we go back to 1900, Eastern New York City, this is way back in the second industrial revolution, the task is to spot a car. It's a pretty difficult task, so I actually circled the car for you. It's one car in a sea of horse-drawn carriages. Now, if we fast forward 13 years to 1913, Easter in New York City, it's a completely different scenario. The task instead is to spot the horse-drawn carriage among a sea of Model T Fords. And the thing that's interesting about this is we recognize these cars. Even though they're over 100 years old, the standards that got set back then are still recognizable to us today. And you see that again in the Third Industrial Revolution. In 1975, we had the Altair computer, which was a clunky punch tape program computer. I've done some assembly, but I don't think I could program in Altair. Now, by 1984, 10 years later, we had the introduction of the Macintosh, the graphical user interface. That became the basis for all modern computing. If you took a child from today and brought them back to 1984 and gave them a Mac, they'd know how to throw something away into the trash can because it's a recognizable standard and interface. And that's what we have to look forward to in the next five to 10 years. We are gonna be setting the standards for artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the standards we set are gonna be in place for 50 years. Now, we have had dramatic changes 
over the past 10 years, just like that change from the Altair to the Macintosh. And we're, we're still kind of in between. We're maybe at the Apple II stage right now. But the dramatic changes have been in two areas. One area is in perception. We have dramatically increased the ability for computers to perceive what's around them. The other area is in decision making. Through deep learning, Q learning, POMDPs, we've improved the ability of computers to make decisions. Now, this is the area where we have the most ability to do work. If you ever have tried to talk to Alexa with anything more than a single sentence, you know there's a lot of room for improvement. But we've made a lot of progress in the past 10 years, and we've set the stage for that improvement. And the two things that have enabled us to do that are big data, which has given us the training set for our ability to train our models. Now, there's a lot of people wor working on learning from sparse example, learning from very small examples the way humans do. And that still is holding great promise, but it's not quite there yet. There's some work at MIT that was recently announced that is pretty promising but still not quite there. So for now, we need big data to be able to train our models. And we also need major processing power. We need GPUs. Now GPUs have moved from gaming to artificial intelligence. They are the source of the brute force processing that enables our artificial intelligence revolution. And there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in GPUs, things like fuzzy GPUs, where the GPU doesn't do good math, but you can pack a lot more transistors into the GPU per square centimeter. These changes in the past 10 years have made difficult tasks almost trivial. If we look at object detection, Back in 2010, object detection was hovering around 70% in terms of uh, correctness. Now, object detection is near 100% in accuracy. It's higher than average human performance. This is a remarkable shift in just a few years. That 70% level, that was not deployable. But when you talk about 99% accurate, that's something you can start to see being deployed into the marketplace. And we see this all over the world where object detection and facial recognition are starting to be incorporated into commercial projects. The other area that's really exciting is in decision-making. So AlphaGo, which is a project by Google, beat Lee Sedol, the world champion in Go, in a series of matches a few years ago. The thing that is amazing about AlphaGo and about its subsequent uh, incarnations is that AlphaGo learned how to play Go without the rules, without us programming structure into the system. It was a completely unstructured system. And that means that it can be applied to other challenges. Now for me, this revolution started in 2005 with Stanford Stanley vehicle at the DARPA Grand Challenge. The first challenge to produce a self-driving car. The DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004 didn't have any people able to complete the challenge. None of the teams got further than I believe a mile. By 2005, Stanley was able to complete the entire course over 100 miles. By 2012, 
the Google autonomous vehicle had traveled over 100,000 miles. And in 2012, I got to take a ride in the Google autonomous vehicle. And I tell you, that thing laid rubber on the road. It drove better than any person I had ever driven with in a closed course. And it was able to do this because it could see everything around it. And it could see everything around it because it had a LIDAR on the roof. Now, I was convinced this was coming commercially in five years. And the engineers at Google just laughed because the LIDAR on the roof at that time cost $75,000, way more than the price of the car. Now, LIDAR has come down in price to 30,000, to 8,000, to 500. And now we're talking about the sub $100 LIDAR. And it's not just LIDAR, a range of sensors and components on the hardware level are becoming commodity. RTK GPS, IMUs, cameras. And what that means is that the sensor suite on a research vehicle from say 2014, 2015, like this Uber research vehicle, that may have cost 100 to $120,000 can now go mass market. And you see the sensor suite in a production vehicle like a Tesla, which admittedly doesn't have LiDAR, but has a good camera array system and can do self-driving. That production price is under $10,000. This means that robots that were once expensive and rare are becoming commodities. And the question is, what does that do to society? So I work at the Humanity Centered Robotics Initiative at Brown University. And one of my core jobs is to think about what impact robots are going to have on society. And when you ask people what impact robots will have, their answer comes down to really two camps. The first camp is the area that you were concerned about in the poll this morning, losing control. And this is something to worry about. If we take the example of the alpha dogfight challenge that was put on by DARPA, the human pilots in that challenge, or the human pilot in that challenge called the targeting system of the AI jet fighters superhuman. It was beyond his capability to keep up with. And that pilot suffered a decisive loss. He lost every single round against the AI agent. But these are just narrow AI agents. They don't have the planning capacity of even a squirrel. So to control these agents, we need to control ourselves. And policy provides a framework for controlling the spread of AI agents. So that area, I'm a little bit less worried about. I'm less worried about the robots rising up. What I'm more worried about is the impact that robots will have on our basic way of life. And that is in our ability to do work. So Fidelity put the, or Prudential put these ads outside of Boston and San Francisco. Robots can't take your job if you're already retired. This is great advertising for boomers, not so great for Gen Z. Um, but the question is, how true is this concept that robots are going to take our jobs that's gotten into the public zeitgeist? Well, Ty Brady at Amazon Robotics went on record saying it's a myth that robotics and automation kill jobs. Just a myth. And for Ty's experience, that is likely true. 
because Amazon has deployed more robots than just about anybody on the face of the planet, and yet has continued a massive hiring spree. But if we look at more established industries, the picture painted is not as rosy. So if we look at manufacturing in the US, between 2000 and 2010, a lot of robots were deployed into manufacturing. And if we go forward between 2000 and 2010, we produced just about the same amount of stuff. I mean, we had some variation because of the recession, but our output in 2010 was just about where it was in 2000. But we produced that output in 2010 with one third fewer workers, almost 5.8 million manufacturing jobs lost in a decade. Now, some of this is attributable to offshoring, but according to Ball State University, they did a good study on this, and about 80% of this is attributable to automation and technology. And this is in structured environments, in our factories. Those advances in perception and decision making that we noted earlier in the talk are enabling robots to move into unstructured environments, into our schools, into our hospitals, into our streets. And what happens when a self-driving truck, like this auto self-driving truck, makes its way into an unstructured environment, into our public roadways? Well, it doesn't bode well for truckers. And truck driving is one of the top jobs in the US outside of retail in most states. There are about 4 million truck drivers. There are about 8 million support service workers who work with truck drivers, people like waitresses at truck stops or diesel mechanics. What happens to these jobs when we start to deploy autonomous vehicles. And the scary thing is that the technology that's enabling the autonomous vehicles also enables robots in other industries. So Flippy the burger flipping robot starts to become a challenge for people in fast food who are currently striking for $15 an hour. What happens if you get that technology to the point where it's just good enough to replace a person? Well, that means the next strike, that person doesn't get their job back. Because ultimately, the, the salary demands of a human being can't compete with the amortized cost of equipment and the cost of electricity and the cost of maintenance on a robot. It's just a different order of magnitude. And it's not just blue collar jobs. White collar jobs are in danger too. Radiologists are at risk uh, from machine learning and computer vision. And there's regulatory frameworks that are slowing this down. But once those regulatory hurdles have been jumped, and the solution is out there, that domain area will be solved, not just once, but for the rest of human history. So how bad is this problem? Well, McKinsey estimates that there are going to be 400 million jobs lost by 2030. 400 million. I mean, this is a big hit, especially now, after we've had a big hit at the start of this decade with a recession that's worse than any we've seen in many decades. Some people though, don't believe this is coming. They don't believe that automation is going to get there. 
Rodney Brooks from iRobot, or co-founder of iRobot, no longer with iRobot, said that Moore's law and exponential laws like Moore's law can fail. And that we may not have the processing power to achieve the automation revolution. We're running out of area where we can cram GPU chips into a specific area, where we're reaching the limits of silicon. So what happens if the exponential curve is an S curve and it levels off? Well, if you look at the state of the art, like this Atlas robot trying to stack a box, this robot's not doing a great job. And that's because outside of those fiducial markers on the box and the fiducial marker as a target, that robot has no idea what anything is in the environment. It's not doing segmentation on every single object the way we do automatically. It doesn't have sensors on its, all of its body parts the way we have skin. It doesn't have kinesthetic awareness. It doesn't have reflexes. It doesn't have all of the stuff that we take for granted that let us navigate in the environment. And the contextual awareness of what the physics of every object is. So let's take a look at another robot. And this is a PR1 research robot, the predecessor to the famed PR2. And he is doing an admirable job cleaning up this room. Now, how is it doing this? Because it seems to know where everything should go. It's doing this in partnership with a person. It's being teleoperated. Now, anyone who's ever teleoperated a robot with a joystick would know this is very hard. The way they did this was with a Da Vinci surgical robot mechanical gantry system. And what we found at Brown is you don't need an expensive Da Vinci mechanical gantry. Off the shelf virtual reality equipment can be used to control robots. At Brown, a couple of students wrote the first open source bridge between Unity and ROS, the robot operating system, that allows you to use VR to control robots. Now this is research, so it's a little bit clunky, but it is about to be really big business. There is a $10 million Avatar X Prize put out by the X Prize Foundation right now that has almost 100 companies competing to build VR interfaces for robots. I want you to think about the labor implications of that. What happens when physical labor is disconnected from geography? During the 2000s, we had the first time in history where intellectual labor was really disconnected from geography and people could outsource to other countries. Well, in the next 15 years, you're going to be able to outsource road work, construction, cleaning up schools, all to a workforce of 3.4 billion people who currently live on less than 550 a day, many of whom are physical laborers already, many of whom would be happy to strap on a VR headset and control a robot in an industrialized nation. So what are we going to do about all this? Well, some people would like to point to startups as the source of new jobs. And I am pro the startup revolution, but I want to offer one caution. Startups may not be producing as many jobs as they used to. If we take an example from this region, Kodak is a traditional company, 140,000 people were employed at peak employment in Kodak. If we take a digital equivalent, Instagram, 
at acquisition, there were 13 employees. Now that grew to a couple hundred, but still orders of magnitude in difference. So what are we gonna do? Well, we need to strengthen social safety nets and you'll hear more about basic income in coming years from all sorts of politicians, so I won't bore you with that. But I will note that automation is about to make a lot of things cheaper. As we can do local manufacturing and regional manufacturing with fully automated factories, it's gonna have a dramatic impact in costs. And I wanna use telecom in the 20th century as an example of what I'm talking about. If you look back to 1915 and the start of the telecommunications revolution, you're talking about nearly $500 for a coast to coast phone call for, per minute in 2015 dollars. If you move forward to 2000, that's 10 cents. By 2015, that's free. Now we do Zooms all the time. It doesn't really cost us much. So things are getting cheaper, but we still have costs that we're going to have to bear. So what will we do for work? Well, I think one area that provides great promise is us working alongside artificial intelligence. The symbiosis between human and machine in decision-making could provide a great deal of opportunity. But that needs to happen with the right interfaces. Why is this an opportunity? It's an opportunity because AI bias is a serious problem. Anyone who has worked with deep learning and big data sets knows that it can be hard to spot bias in a data set. I'm gonna give two examples of this, just to hammer the point home. The first is a dog wolf detector that was written by some researchers that was determining between huskies and wolves. And this is a husky that was misidentified as a wolf by the dog wolf detector. Now, the researchers want to know, why was this husky misidentified? And they rewrote the algorithm to explain to them what it was paying attention to when it made its classification. Now, for most humans, if you are looking, you would say, okay, I'll pay attention to the ears, the snout, the eyes, the fangs, some characteristic of the dog. What this paid attention to was the snow in the background of the picture. Because there is bias in the data set where there is snow in the background of most of the pictures of wolves. What they had built was not a dog wolf detector. They'd built a snow detector and they didn't even know it. Another example from Rich Caruana of Microsoft Research, gets to the solutions to these types of problems. So Rich was making a machine learning algorithm for pneumonia admission at hospitals. And what he was finding is that it was very accurate in predicting who should stay in the hospital and who should go home, except everybody with asthma it was sending home. And he didn't think that sounded right. So he went to the doctors and he asked them, what's the deal with patients with asthma? And they told him that asthma was a risk factor for complications. So people with asthma go straight to the ICU to get special care. And that brought up the fact that ICU data was not being properly represented in his data set. And he realized if he missed this, a major risk factor, what else could he be missing? So he rewrote 
his machine, he scrapped his machine learning model and he rewrote it as a general additive model. Okay. And he presented each one of the factors that was being considered in the model as a human readable graph to human experts. So age versus risk, cancer versus risk, asthma versus risk. And what he did was he was able to validate the model with human experts. And what this proposes to me is a future where we are working together with machine learning that's written to be intelligible. Right now, if you take a machine learning algorithm and you have identify a duck, it will tell you 87% chance that's a duck. But it has no context. It has no capability to say, I believe that's a duck because it has webbed feet, it has a bill, it has wings, and it's going to a pond. Those contextual clues are used by humans all the time. And what we need to do, and what's a great opportunity for businesses, is to build intelligible AI that uses contextual clues. And if we can get contextual clues right, we will solve a bigger problem with AI, and that's morality. So this is the MIT moral machine. It's a moral norms experiment that tries to determine what self-driving cars should do in an accident. Should they hit the bank robber and the little girl, or should they crash into the barrier and kill the occupants of the car? The interesting thing about this is that MIT presented this to millions of people around the world. And thousands of people saw each scenario. And the data set it generated showed the geographic differences in human morality. Some countries would always save children. Some countries would always save the elderly. That is a basic moral decision that needs to be represented according to the cultural norms of the place you're working in. And that gets to another project that we're working on that holds great promise for industry if it can be represented well. And that is context engines. Like I was saying before, if you can get contextual clues to machine learning and make machine learning that can explain itself to people through those contextual clues, you can start to have machine learning that's not an alien intelligence to us. And together with machine learning, when we can communicate with AI algorithms, what we can accomplish is powerful. So this next example is from Unanimous AI. And it is a Ouija board that shows the winners potentially of the Kentucky Derby. And they had experts draw that, we move that Ouija board around. And based on the strength of their movements, it picked winners. It was so good that it didn't just pick the winner of the Kentucky Derby. It picked every place in the Kentucky Derby. It picked a superfecta, something so rare that if you bought a $20 or $40 ticket, you won over $10,000. And that is just an example of the power that comes from humans working with AI systems. And we're gonna need that because the world is about to get weird. So which one of these people is real? The one on the left or the one on the right? I'll let you sit with that for a second. Okay, trick question. 
neither one's real. These are both GAN-generated faces. Ultimately, we are entering a world where GANs and deepfakes are going to pose a challenge to what we can tell is real. If we can't determine truth from fiction, we can't make those moral norms. We can't make that capability to have consensus. So we're going to need AI to help us spot what's fake and what's generated from what's real. Ultimately, though, I think that what we need to focus in on are the big problems. Saving our planet, lifting people out of poverty, advancing economic growth, these are one and the same fight, according to Ban Ki-moon. And if you look at the problems we're facing, climate adaptation, forest fires, aging populations, water management, there's a range of issues that are big challenges. They're gonna require a lot of innovation and employment. And I think that if companies can focus in on the technologies, robotics, AI, open source, VR, MR, then they can find the opportunities to build new products and services to meet those challenges. And that's where I think there's a great corporate opportunity. If we can look at, say, just in the example of open source, all of the open source packages that are poorly maintained in AI and machine learning, and corporations can figure out what's important and what needs to be adopted by the corporation and devote some cycles to supporting an open source project. That can provide us the basic infrastructure to build the next generation of AI, the basic infrastructure to build those context engines, to build that moral reasoning, to build that VR control. And with that, I'm going to move it to questions. Thank you. All right, great. Peter, that was fantastic. I mean, I hope everyone just loved that talk. I mean, you gave us a lot of real world examples, which are great, right? And I didn't even know all those stats, right? That even object, uh, what was it? Object, object detection. Detection, the AI is actually becoming better than human detection, which that's, that's crazy, right? And that chart that shows how much it's grown over the last couple of years Hi. is great. I'm so uh, thank you so much. Too. That was great. Now, if anyone is there, please type in your questions right now. We're getting those through the chat. I see there's a couple here uh, quickly coming in. Before we get to these questions, what, is the, what are you working on right now? And what is that exciting part of what you're working on right now? So one thing I'm working on right now that really excites me is a modification of the MIT moral machine experiment where we are trying to put people into virtual reality car crashes or near crash scenarios. And then we're judging the scale of the car crash using finite element analysis uh, to see how bad the car crash was and using that to teach self-driving cars how to avoid car crashes because it's a huge big data problem like right now if you look at the data set that self-driving cars have been taught on it's mostly good driving in scenarios where i mean fortunately in the real world car crashes are not very statistically uh high uh for self-driving cars there's only been one self-driving car in a car crash so far um, or in a major, major accident. Um, so so that, that data set in virtual reality can provide the big data for learning for those self-driving cars and hopefully help them avoid a lot of accidents. 
Wow. Yeah, it, that was very interesting to hear about the moral aspect of it, right? Because we see a lot of the robotics and you showed a couple of videos and it was quite funny. Some people were like, oh, that robot has the case of Mondays <laughs> when it fell <laughs> over. Like that was quite funny. Uh, but it, it's so interesting to see that the progression over the years yeah and now it's getting into that moral right it's before it was like okay it's making things easier um, but now it's how does that machine going to make a a or b result and what is the best moral result and so that's so interesting um, also you, you were kind of representing a lot of different areas where it sounds like uh, machines, AI is going to displace a lot of jobs, right? So I didn't even know that I, I knew there was a lot of truck drivers out there. I didn't know that many of the states all over that was the number one employment category outside of retail, outside of retail. Like that's very interesting, right? And so it's where do they go once trucks become uh, self driving, right? And, and it was interesting. I like how you showed the VR aspect of it, uh, which is very interesting to me. Can you talk to us a little bit more about, A, how close are we to that? And what's the future of, say, a truck driver? Yeah, so right now the VR interfaces are still in development by a lot of companies. Um, I've seen VR-controlled backhoes. I've seen VR-controlled self-driving cars where a driver takes over. Um, a lot of the constraints are around latency and bandwidth. Like you don't want to have a teleoperated car out there on the streets and then lose connection. Mm. So some of this comes down to infrastructure and 5G. Um, but some of this is also ready to be deployed like things like construction site robots with VR controls. Mm -hmm. that that's getting to the point with the backhoes where they're, they're ready to be deployed pretty soon because they can get a wired connection out to the construction site and then they can uh, do wireless to the machine. Um, in terms of the future for people who've been displaced, I think a lot of that comes down to how we build our interfaces for the new technologies. If we can be good at UX design for building good UX interfaces for people, say, VR controlling a robot, um, so switching to a new job where they're controlling robots, um, then that transition will be easier. Um, but if we do really poor interface design, it's going to be a much harder transition. The other thing we can do is we can actually put in place license standards for operation of robots. Mm. So right now, you forklift, forklift operators can get licensed, car drivers can get licensed, but robot operators, there's no, there's no licensing body for robot operators. So if we can get those licensing standards in place by state, that could help stop some of the displacement from people abroad taking all those jobs. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And, and my team uh, is based around UX, UI, and making interfaces uh, easier. And so that's interesting to see. Now, I know a lot of our viewers today come from a technology background, right? So, um, which a lot of this is probably very exciting for their businesses, right? How can we make things easier? How can we make them more efficient? What are some of the uh, job roles that you see being in the future, right? Because right now I encourage my kids, go learn a computer, go. My two sons are trying to design logos, trying to create companies, trying to use the, the internet to build out products. They even created their own e-commerce site. So they're trying to think that way. What are some of the other fields when it comes to robotics that you see showing up? Well, I, I think there's, obviously a huge opportunity in making and robotics and, and building stuff physically. Um, we, we lost a lot of that in our educational system. A lot of shop classes disappeared and, and people didn't build things with their hands as much anymore. I think bringing some of that back is actually really important um, to give kids the skills 
to be able to make the next generation of technology. Um, but in addition to that, I, I feel like there is a great opportunity for kids in technologies that we haven't even considered yet as being uh, emerging, but are about to really uh, show themselves as game-changing technologies. So biotech, hmm. um, like the cost of building a home PCR machine, uh, which is a machine for doing gel electrophoresis, um, it's come down to like a hundred dollars. Um, so like kids can actually do like genetic engineering at home. <laughs> like they're, they're, they're wet labs for just like their maker spaces. They're DIY wet labs for like doing genetic engineering now. So I, I feel like some of this stuff, like in the biotech space is about to get crazy as well. And it's being enabled because a lot of these medical technologies are getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, so I, I have a colleague at Stanford who does um, robotic microscopes that can uh, identify diseases in emerging markets. And um, it's all open source technology. Anyone can take that and riff off of it. I feel like kids should find an open source project that really excites them and riff off that open source project, whether it's hardware or software. Great. So a question from v Vanessa, how would controlling robotics through VR impact the healthcare and people with disabilities and special needs? Well, there's already a, a robotic cafe in Japan that's controlled entirely by people who I believe are paraplegic um, and who all have disabilities, but um, have physical disabilities where they can't go out there and serve coffee like in their actual physical bodies. So they control robots to serve coffee. Mm. Um, and I feel like there's gonna be a lot more of that. Um, I, I feel like ultimately if we can, again, build those interfaces right, we can make it possible for people to control robots in a wide range of scenarios. And we've actually worked at Brown. We, we have a center called uh, the Carney Center, which has got a program called BrainGate, which builds computer brain interfaces for controlling robotic arms. And um, the the ability to control an arm with your thoughts is definitely near. Um, it still gets a little complicated, like brain signals are not as easy to parse out. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've got some work that needs to happen in that realm. So like right now, if say a cat jumps on the table while you're trying to grab a Coke, you're gonna lose track of what that Coke is. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but if we combine AI, machine learning, and computer brain interface, for a lot of people with disabilities, it's going to mean much easier control of robots. Wow. So another question, what is the hardest part of robotics today? I, I watched a video before, and it was like grabbing things with fingers, the fingers part. Yeah. What are some of the hard parts about robotics today? I mean... Robots are really stupid right now. They're, they're really dumb. Like I was saying with the Atlas robot, it has no context. Mm -hmm. And we've been working on uh, creating, using mixed reality and virtual reality to try to create semantic maps. So uh, maps of objects in an environment for the robot to understand that are linguistically grounded. So if you said to the robot, go turn on the light switch, the robot one knows what a light switch is and two, how to turn that light switch on. I think building these kind of contextual engines for robots is a big area because a lot of the other stuff um, is getting solved bit by bit. The other big area that I think is huge is in creating 
low cost reflexes for robots. Um, so right now, robots don't have a lot of sensors all over them. I mean, they've got some sensors, but compared to us, they don't have skin. Mm -hmm. Like they can't feel everything. Um, so, so being able to build a combination of sensors and reflex is a really powerful uh, concept called neuroethology, um, where you look at the neural structures of simple animals and you start to replicate that in robots. Um, I think that's going to be another big area for doing lower cost, lower processing power robots. Wow. That's great. One last question, um, and, and thank you, Peter, as we get into our next speaker. So this is a question from Kevin. If machines become so good at detecting images or making conclusions based on observation, where does the need for human specialists go? And I know you kind of mentioned that a little bit before, but... Yeah, so, I mean, there is... There are people who are concerned about... Um, the hyper advancement of this technology where we reach a singularity where robots can outperform or AI agents can outperform humans at any human task. Um, but there are a lot of assumptions based into that. Um, and right now we're so far from that milestone. Like if I could have a robot that had the advanced planning capabilities of a squirrel, I'd be really excited because squirrels can like go and get nuts for the winter and like know that like it's going to be cold in like six months and uh, robots can't do that right now. I mean, robots, robots, like they're very narrow. When we say narrow AI, they're very narrow in their focuses and their goals. Yeah, they can play a video game and win the video game, but if you take that agent outside of the video game, like it's it's not going to succeed in the world. Mm -hmm. So so I think that that's a future concern. But if we can build in the intelligibility, if we can build in the explainability in the AI systems, then when we get to that super intelligence point. I think we'll have to worry about it less because it'll actually be able to talk to us. It won't be a super intelligence that's completely alien. So great. That, that's, those, those are the far future thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Peter. It's been amazing having Peter here today. Uh, thank you so much. If, if anyone would like to ask Peter more questions, where are some places they can get in touch with you? Yes, sure. Um, so I'm on Twitter. Uh, so I'm Peter underscore Haas, and uh, I can be reached uh, there pretty easily. Um, you can also go to PeterHaas.co, and I've got a contact form, and you can reach me there. Great. Well, Great. thank you so much. Thank you.